Hello, and welcome to part two of the How Fit is Your HCM webinar series. Today, we'll be talking about how can an HR fitness program take you to the next level. My name is Jenna Sloan, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, a few housekeeping measures. Today's webinar will be recorded and made available online. We will send a link to access the webinar and slide deck within a couple hours of today's webinar. There will be time for Q&A at the end of today's webinar. Um, however, your mics are on mute, so when you have questions, simply type them in the questions box. Today's presenter is Richard George. Richard is the Vice President of Strategic Services at Sierra Cedar. He has over 25 years of experience with system integration that spans many vendor solutions and both HR and financial systems. Richard is a subject matter expert in a multitude of areas that include strategic HCM systems roadmaps, HCM technology needs assessment, systems evaluation, vendor selection, process reengineering implementation, organization change management, and comprehensive end user training. In addition to his executive role, Richard also leads Sierra Cedars initiative with Oracle's cloud system. We are very excited to have you join us today, Richard. Welcome. I will now turn to these pres today's presentation over to Richard, who will tell us more about how to access or assess your systems and create a roadmap for the future. Thank you, Jenna, and you're well, way too kind to me. Um, just to, to start this off, I met a man on the right at the elevator this morning. I greeted him and asked him, is he ready for the day? And he said he was born ready. And I just love that enthusiasm. That's how I like to start every day myself. And to start this presentation, if I get my little clicker to work, there we go, is we're starting off, I see way too many, I see clients every week that are, are just having an effort. They spend a lot of effort just working to get the payroll out, um, get their compliance reporting done, and if we talk about strategy for them, they, they look at me and strategy. <laughs> we're, we're just trying to get the um, reports out so that we stay compliant and they don't have time really to look at from who they're hiring to how they're supporting the organization's objectives. They just, they just work week in, week out, and, and work hard, very hard. Um, I, I want to... Okay, say this picture is one that I took on the left of the fighting for talent. I come from, I live in Colorado, and the unemployment rate there is 2.3%. Can you believe that? 2.3%. And, and I think the U.S. generally considers full employment around 5%. Um, this almost could have been a picture that I, I took, though. The point being is that organizations don't ever want to get to that point where you're fighting for talent. You want to be able to look into the future. You want systems that support what you, who you need, what the skill sets you need, and then select people and pick somebody who not only is a great fit today, but can learn, develop, grow with the organization so that you don't have high turnover, you have low costs to um, maintain your hiring, and you can spend money developing people versus hiring people. And that's really just goes, ties everything together of making sure, is your HR system, you know, is it supporting your needs? Is it supporting the organization's objectives? And that's really, could be for some people, new thinking and new results. Um, just a, a quick picture of myself, my contact information, Richard.George, and I'll have this at the very end as well if you need to contact me at sierracedar.com, my phone number, and Seriously, if you have a question, comment, um, suggestion, critique, um, absolutely feel free to contact me. A brief um, summary of just what our organization does, what my organization does for strategic services starting in the 12 o'clock position. From HCM benchmarking with um, ERP strategic roadmaps, sometimes business cases are required for organizations, sometimes they're not. Um, looking at system selections, and while a lot of systems look very similar, um, there are differences in making sure you get something that you need, when you need it, um, and if you need to go that route. 
Um, regardless, though, I think that if you're simply updating your current system or looking at a new system, there's also some oftentimes business processes that need to be updated. And the piece that I see so many organizations just forgetting about is the change management. So if you're looking at a new system, if you're bringing in new people, if you're changing processes, it's having that organization change management. So you're readying the people, you're getting them engaged, you're communicating with them. And we'll talk a little bit about the value of this at the very end. Um, just to slide on who the organization is, if you're not familiar with Sierra Cedar, we do have seven solution areas, a full service offering. We have been doing technology research for 19 years. In fact, we just closed our 20th um, survey and we can expect some pretty interesting results out of that. And I'll, I'll make a little bit of a reference to that survey later on. But 2,000 employees in our, the industries that we serve, and of course, thousands and thousands of projects. Some days I think like I've worked on all thousands, but um, I haven't. So what's the issue here, really? Um, is it your systems? Um, do you have too many? Do you not have enough? Are they not meeting the functions that you really need? Are your processes, well, are they just convoluted and, and take too much time? And people, if you have the wrong people in the wrong position, um, well, I can't help you specifically there. A new system can help you develop people so that they do have skills and competency. That's part of an overall HCM system. They can also help get them routed to the right places, and in worst case scenario, they also help get the documentation done, so if they want to seek pursuits elsewhere, they can. Um, and with that, we want to have just a, a brief poll question. And Dana, can you run that um, poll question? So the few areas while you're looking at the, the poll, I'll be going through helping develop the vision that you need, the objectives for the for your organization, for the HCM or ERP, whichever you're in, um, benchmarking, system assessments, creating a roadmap, and if you need to, um, what are some of the steps with solutions collection? The purpose here is that I'll, I'll talk about some specifics on how to actually do that and the value of it, and um, help get you started there and there's some things that you can do absolutely on your own and get you a long ways there and then there are some that take a little more effort and I'll point those out and where you might want some help. And I think Jana you closed the poll and you're going to be sharing that I think. Jen, I don't know if you're showing that. Yes, or not. Uh, sorry, I Richard. I was I muted myself. I didn't want anyone to hear background noise. Yes. Um. So our results are: um, 25% of y'all said a lot, 42% of y'all said a little, and 33% said none whatsoever. Thank you, Janet, because that's that's sort of what I expected. And if I can just take a, a, a brief aside on here, if we go way back before any of us was, were born. And I just read this and, and saw this interesting statistic that when electricity was first brought into industry in the U.S., and I, I think that's way older than any of us, they used to use steam engines, and factories were organized around the steam engine, steam pipes, etc. And when they brought electricity and electric motors, they didn't see any change in productivity for 25 years until somebody finally had the bright idea that we can reorganize the shop floor, we can reorganize work, we can change things a lot. And they did, and that's had a huge change in, in industry. Um, but it took 25 years, and if I make an analogy here, technology for systems has changed tremendously, and just one facet of that is mobile, and a lot of us don't, aren't using as much as we can, and so we haven't seen a change in productivity. I, I just found that interesting. So how do we get to, you know, from here to there? Um, I like to start always at the very top and making sure that we understand what the organization's vision is. What is the organization trying to do? Are they going into new industries? 
Are they expanding? Are they contracting and shedding some industries? All that boils down to well, one area is, are we supporting the organization's vision in our, our area, whether that be HR or IT or ERP, um, from whatever? Are we supporting the organization's vision? And are we adding the maximum value to it? Oftentimes, we don't have a, a, a clear vision statement for ourselves. We're not truly supporting it. But we, if we expect to be valued and um, people will say have a seat at the table, um, but if you want to be noticed and want to become a key, key to the organization, you need to have that vision statement with objectives to support the organization. It needs to be published. It needs to be current. And therefore, I think if it's your HCM system or your ERP system or whatever system you're in charge of, it needs to support that vision as well. And it, and it just gets no simpler than that. One piece that we, we need to keep in mind when creating that vision is the audience. And different audiences need different messages. If we're talking to finance, they want to talk about a little bit about the ROI and the cost and the value. They, of course, want to know what the thing does and, and what we're getting out of it. If we're talking to the CEO, that's where he, what he, number one, wants to know is how is the organization benefiting from that? So different audiences and different people are looking at things differently. And that's the content. And we want to make sure the context is is appropriate for that audience, the right level of detail, that it's cast right, that it's applicable to them, and it's clear. I use my wife sometimes, who's not in this industry, when I'm making a presentation or have something that's important to present, to make sure that she understands it. If I'm writing something, if she understands it, it's clear. And not that she's a dummy, she's got an MBA and, and she's uh, um, much smarter than me. Um, but she's, because she's not in the industry, I use her as a foil to make sure something's clear. And promises, always under promise, over deliver. Um, that's a good rule in life. So I talked a little bit about Sierra Cedars survey, our HR technology, our system survey. And I'm going to use the talent-driven organization here as just an example. And what this is, this is just a small carve-out out of the survey results. And if you want the entire survey, just go to our website. It's 100 pages. Um, it's packed full of information. But if you're going to read it, make sure that you um, have a lot of time because it is big and um, pull out of it the information that you want. But a talent-driven organization, those are mature organizations in career planning, succession management. They use metrics to help drive the org to make decisions. A little additional detail on that, um, and I compare the, on the left-hand side, we have five areas, then we compare the talent-driven to just, just all the results that we had in general. And I want to say, wow, what a difference between a talent-driven organization and a non-talent, and how effective they are that they do 100% of these org talent-driven organizations do succession management. If they miss a key person, key personnel gets um, out of the organization, they know where the, the success was coming from. They use analytics. They identify their retention risk far better than the non-talent, and they use analytics. But why? Why, why go through all of that? Well, strategic value, much bigger. You know, it's 53% bigger. Oh, more than that, I see this is what catches the CEOs, the CFOs, your board, everybody's attention is the return on equity. 33% higher for a talent-driven organization. And again, there's more information exactly how to become a talent-driven organization in our survey. So I, if you don't have that, you can go to our website and download it. And those organizations generate 1.4 or the say. 40% more revenue per employee. Tremendous. That's why they do it. And that's what a new, that's what a modern system that meets your requirements can do for you. 
So let's look at some of the steps in figuring out your systems and how to get there. I say benchmarking is really one of the first steps. And the reason I say it's the first step is because it gives you facts, it gives you data, it gives you information that you can you know, put into a business case. You can't put in your benchmark, you can't put in your roadmap. And why, um, why benchmark? Well, the organization's changed. It, we've seen technology change. Um, your competitive environment has changed. There's just so many things that have changed that if you have, if you're still using the same system, it may not be meeting your needs. And I say may not because I don't know what your specific situation is. Um, but I do know that almost everything has changed in the last few years and improved. Um, I look at assessing the system as well as this, and this is perhaps a softer side of looking at your policies and processes. Um, I, I've seen some policies that just take tremendous time, which impact processes, because people are simply trying to get information. They're not necessarily trying to approve something or stop something from happening. They simply need to be informed, and in, in some organizations they've had um, convoluted processes that engage C-level people for approvals when all the C-level people needed was information and the current system couldn't do that. Now, part of an assessment is the cost and benefits. What are you getting out of your system, the cost? Um, also identifying what works really well for you and, and those things that don't work so well. Um, to keep those in mind, and I'll, I'll talk about how we're using this information in a moment. And then looking at the future growth. Where is the company going? And this goes back to their objectives. Are they trying to increase market share? Are they trying to increase profitability? Enter into new or new fields? And then I'll stress this through many slides. Document this and share this. Um, become transparent. So if we look at a benchmark, this is something I mentioned at the very beginning. There are things that you can do just by yourself um, without too much difficulty and other things you may need to engage someone to help you with. But here's just a sample benchmark. And I look at it as a maturity level. And just starting at the top from feature adoption of how many things are you using out of your system to communication, testing. If you have customizations or don't, interfaces, a number of systems that you have. And what this is, this is sometimes called a spider graph or a radar graph, and I have a couple examples of this. They're really useful when you're measuring different things. And overall, the further out it is from the bullseye, the better it is, is, is how it works. And I have some other examples which we can talk about. So we can see this organization that this is done from the number of systems, the number of interfaces. They were measured really high on that, that they they only had one system and their number of interfaces were um, consolidated so that from benefit providers to payroll providers, um, banks, et cetera, they had a minimum number of those and they met their needs. But as far as testing and, and training and feature adoption, not so good. Um, but this is something that, that you can do you know, a good deal of by yourself. Uh, and if you want more information on it, again, contact me. This is an example of a um, benchmark that we do. It's much more of a detailed assessment. So we look at five different, well, multiple different areas, starting with administrative and service and going down to where social media. And we look at the overall adoption. I mean, in this case, right underneath the word overall adoption, we have N equals 1266. That's how many organizations, not people, but organizations this represents. 1,200, almost 1,300 organizations. And we, we measure how your organization matches to the overall assessment. And if you go to the right, we compare against competitors, industries. Um, in this case, this is the customer that was running PeopleSoft. And N equals six, that means how many of those really narrow that match this, this um, client, how many of them met, et cetera. And then we can measure whether they are leading that group or lagging that group or at market with that group. And then each one of these drills down to more and more detail. It's, um, it, it's a 
fairly comprehensive report. And again, all it does is present facts about where you are with your system and how it compares to from competitors to the overall industry. And if it's not a lot green, then you're, you're spending too much money, you're spending too much time, you're not getting enough information out of your system. Then if we look at, after we have that, that benchmark data, what do we do with it? Well, we really want to create a strategic roadmap on how to get from here to there. And some of the, I, I summarized a couple of really important reasons on why you should have a roadmap. I see a lot of organizations not have one. They have it in their head about what they're gonna do or it's on a wet board. But it really should be documented um, organized, prioritized. It helps anyway, it helps me when I'm doing this to really put together something that makes sense and I, I don't create a an idea that can never be achieved and I can't communicate it with others. Um, we need to put things in writing and it needs to be understandable. And if it is both understandable and clearer and compelling, then we get buy-in. Um, buy-in from those that supply people, supply money, supply um, the, the willpower to help get something done. So this is, uh, I have three examples of some strategic roadmaps. This is simply one, there's not one that's better for the other. Remember I talked about the audience. Um, some people like things in grids, some people want things more graphical. Um, so let's think about who we're presenting to and, and have it presented to them in the best way. So generally, I think that three-year roadmaps are um, the best, um, and the best being that technology changes so fast. And um, the iPhone's 10 years old, but the iPad is, is pretty new, and people say it's getting old in tooth, and um, they're looking for the next best, greatest thing. But we all know that technology has trained, changed tremendously, and so we are, we try to keep it down to three years. Um, and in this area, we're looking at um, a couple of, of I, well, many items from priorities and from things that are compliance issues. And it's surprising that on a good system assessment, when you're looking at your system, you may find some items out of compliance before you ever get to the must haves and required versus nice to have. We color code this. Um, and again, going back to our survey, you can get definitions, but from administrative systems all the way down to performance. And then simply list down in the column under the opportunity roadmap a brief description of the project. We look at resources, whether you think consulting is necessary or not, priorities, descriptions, effort, value. And then behind each one of these is a lot of detail from costs and benefits and who's involved, who's going to be a champion of it. And then we just simply document when we think the project will start, what quarter, and when it will end. Again, this is fairly um, simplified just for display purposes. But we talked about different audiences needing different needs. Same idea here, color-coded by different areas, showing when projects start, when they end, um, how important they are. Um, just a different way of, of displaying the information. And depending on your organization, there's lots of ways to do this. Um, this is just another way. Um, a third way is, again, I, I talked about a radar map or a spider chart. This is one that's looking at um, different areas, and it's for IT. But it, um, the bullseye shows 2009, so it's a little bit dated. Um, but it goes, as you go out, the years go out, and I think this describes the idea that people can see where projects are, that need to happen right now and as, where they go out. The size of the um, dot is the size of the project, small dot, small project. And red, green, yellow, green are easy layup projects, and red are those ones that are, let's say, the half court shot. Um, maybe the Grand Slam is admitted in baseball season. But just a different way to show information. Again, each dot on here should have a whole bunch of information behind it from who's responsible. Um, probable cost, and I'm not looking at 
detailed costs where you've gone out to vendors and, and know exactly how much it costs per head exactly, and the exact implementation costs, et cetera. I'm looking at some ideas so that we know that how much should be budgeted um, and what the benefits are, perhaps for getting rid of some old systems, um, more information, et cetera. So looking at your roadmap, how to develop it, I break it down to, to five steps, basically. Um, one, prep and planning, and that's really involving you, maybe your staff, if you have a staff, but just a few key people about what are you trying to do with that roadmap. And setting up the general direction that you're heading, what do you want to accomplish? And then talking with some key stakeholders. So if that's an HCM area, with your HCM leadership. If it's ERP finance, supply chain, talking with those people. Talking with IT should be part of the stakeholders if you're talking about systems. I say that even if it's a SaaS system, um, no matter what, they're involved. So those key stakeholders, looking at your workshops, development workshops, and those expand to your SMEs, your subject matter experts and your stakeholders, getting them involved. And this is one area I'll drill down a little bit because there's a lot that happens here. Um, communicate to everybody what's happened now and, and update them on what you're looking at with your roadmap. And it's really vetting it so that people aren't caught off guard and it's um, getting your key sponsors, making sure that they're committed and involved in this place. And those key sponsors are, are those folks that are giving you people, money, time, um, they might put it down on objectives. Um, but you also want to include those people that need to be informed, and they can often say no and be roadblocks. So it's important to have them involved as well, um, getting everybody on the, the team. And then execute it, and don't forget to revise it. Um, every six months, I'd say, um, look at it. Every year, it should be revised and updated because you've accomplished things. If this is a three-year roadmap, you've only got two years, you need to update those two years that are remaining. You may have some projects that rolled over onto that that didn't get completed or started for some reason. And you have a new year to look at. Again, what's in it? I look at these things as the width and what's in it for me. You're a key stakeholder yourself and you increase your value by doing this. Um, Number three was that, that workshop, that roadmap development. Um, again, just some key points here is that once you've identified what you're trying to accomplish, what you'd like to see, is to identify and invite those stakeholders, those ones that are really key that will supply. These ones I look at are the supplying the resources and, and are responsible for that area. Make sure they have an agenda. Nobody likes to have a meeting with an agenda, especially if it's takes more than five minutes. Even if five minutes I have organizations that just, or people I'll say, won't refuse to meet if there's not an agenda. And I try to always have an agenda. It clarifies my mind on what we're trying to accomplish. Um, it helps them carve out time and prepare as well. And that agenda should have what, what the purpose of the meeting, what are we expecting to deliver? And this is gonna be the only time I'll read to you. you know, what questions are we addressing? the scope and boundaries of the meeting. And here you may need to have a roadmap. I mean, not a roadmap, a uh, parking lot, sorry. Um, a parking lot because everybody will get out of scope and out of bounds. And the way to manage them is to acknowledge that they've got a great point, great idea, whatever it is, and document it in writing on a flip chart or on the web board so they can see it. I like flip charts better because they know it's not going to be erased um, and, it, and it won't get erased. But they will be very satisfied that you've acknowledged them and, and documented it. And there might be some guidance for preparation. May you may include some documentation for them to read over, keep it short and to the point, very relevant. Um, you may have some URLs in there with links for those that like to go a little bit further. And remember the logistical information that they've got the rooms, their drinks that are needed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when all this is done for the workshop, they're really ready to get involved. 
Some critical success factors I talked about leadership commitment to make sure you meet with those key stakeholders even before the meeting to get information from them on, on what their views are and their backing to it. And if they can only come to the meeting maybe for the kickoff, um, if it's the, CH, the, the chief HR officer or the CFO or the IT um, VP, make sure that they can at least come to the kickoff, the beginning of the meeting to show their commitment. Clear success, critical success factor, that vision and objective is just crystal clear, the scope and the risks that, are peop that people see, um, getting buy-in, then communication on the status. We talk to people, publish what's happened so they can see and they know what's involved. Um, last little point on that, I talked about organization change management um, as being just really a key, off, key thing that has to be included with any project. Whether you're changing your systems, whether you're upgrading your systems, whether you're bringing in new organization, new people, um, it's helping them understand what's changing, how they're involved, that they're really valued, and it has to be really honest communication. In some places, new systems, new processes, it might actually make one person do more work or do something that they they didn't have to do before. A, a classic example are some customizations and systems from year ago automated things that never should have been automated, things that were done once, twice a year. Now your decustomization, let's say, with an upgrade or with a new system, that, that specialized function is no longer available. Let them know that that's going to be a manual process for them now, and here's why. But when organization change management is involved, and this is from ProSci, we have similar results in our survey. Staying on budget, meeting your objectives, staying on schedule, dramatically better. And it makes sense. If you are communicating to people from a, a benchmark, what you found and how you compare, if you tell people about the roadmap on where you are, where you want to go, what's involved with it, you're much more likely to have success. And I, I, it's summer vacation, so for example, if we were going on a road trip to somewhere that's a, a day away, a better part of the day, maybe overnighter. If we tell the whole family where we're going, where we're staying, when we're leaving, what to take, where we're staying that night, and if you have teenage boys, most importantly, where you stop and eat every couple of hours, um, you're going to get tremendous buy-in and less complaints. Well, I'll say less, as I said, less complaints if it's a road trip but they'll buy into it. Same for your organization. Some organizations really require business cases. They want to, they can see the logic of it, um, but they need to have something submitted that talks about the return on investments, ROI, um, the risks and mitigating factors, to talk about governance of who's gonna be in charge of this. So the strategic, and that's just timely, accurate information to support decisions and maybe getting that may include getting um, the, the softer costs the softer benefits and then that's I think should always be included um, people never object to that but it must always include the quantifiable costs and quantifiable benefits and, and that's from your labor from changing processes systems that you may be able to eliminate um, changing work locations. Um, there's just a lot of ways that costs can be quantified and reduced and improve um, improve people's um, lot in life. They don't like doing inefficient processes any more than we do. So we looked at the vision, the benchmarking, road mapping. Sometimes you may need a new system. You simply are at an end of life with the system. You may be um, on a system that doesn't have um, what, it, what you need. Um, you may not have the people to support that system. So you need to go into a brand new solution. How do you do that? Well, a couple of easy steps here. And again, this is, will be published and, and sent out to you. So the first three steps here, just looking at your current state, documenting your strategy and the user's expectations. This is really just getting some information about what your 
systems do overall, what the roadmap is. You'll find if you dig hard enough, you have some shadow systems where people are keeping track of information so on three by five cards to Word, to Excel, and, and, and more. Um, people have a different idea on the strategy and the outcomes that they're expecting. Um, and we do look to try to include stakeholders, and we talked about that in the roadmap, where you're getting the influencers and, and regions, business units, different groups. What are their expectations from a system and from, let's say, your, your specific organization? Then we look at do some research. So we know what's, what they're expecting, but some of their high level requirements are. So what are, are really some of the must have outcomes, those key requirements? And let's match those to key user expectations. Um, narrowing the field, there's a lot of systems out there. There are systems I've never heard of. There are systems that I have no idea who runs them. Um, but someone must, but we try to narrow the field and, and there are several ways to do that from looking at Gartner or Forrester or our own information. Um, there are associations, there's blogs, there's events. Um, there's a lot of places to find what, where there are systems, where the good, the bad, the ugly with them, and then try to narrow it down to a few systems. And I've seen this go as high as six or seven systems for demonstrations, the initial demonstrations. And with, um, SaaS systems now, you can ask for just a remote demo that's unscripted, you know, show me your best, and, and then narrow that down to two or three that you really thought hit the mark with you, it resonated with you. Then, then develop scripted demos, and this is really key. So it's a scripted demo, often we've heard that we want to have a day in the life of, so whether it's from procurement, um, you know, the financial side, so we're looking at supply chain or if we're looking at um, recruiting to retiring we want to have a day in the life so we can see how do you go through all these processes you can't hit all the processes hit those that are really important to you that cause you do a lot and cause cost a lot for you to do you need to do it all in one week do scripted demos do them back to back uh, I wouldn't look at more than three solutions I, I really got to narrow that down uh, and get them all done, you need to have the same team involved when you're doing this review. Um, sometimes we do the RFP before the demos, but oftentimes we're doing the RFP after the demos because sometimes we are seeing things in the demo that we just didn't really maybe think about, that we didn't know that was available. It was a, it was a new feature um, that is really a differentiator. Um, and the RFP goes into more detail than what we would do for a demo. They have some, some specific things so that if you do work, and I know that Brazil is a difficult country, um, excuse me if you come from Brazil, but it's, it's a difficult country to do business with because it has a lot of requirements that are different than other people and they speak Portuguese there. And so if that was a key requirement, um, making sure the system has some support for Portuguese um, from a language to compliance reporting. We look at the last two um, relationship testing, making sure that that system is used in your industry for organizations like you. Um, no, I shouldn't say no one, but so few people ever do an on-site visit. It's, it's ridiculous. It does cost money. Um, it's, it's at least an overnighter um, somewhere. So there's cost, travel, and living that probably wasn't budgeted. Um, but these are cheap dollars to spend to talk to somebody that's using that system that you think is, is the finalist to make sure what would they do different, what were their lessons learned, um, what would they do again, um, how many, you know, what was their implementation team like, um, long-term services and support. Um, just so much information you can get out of that on-site visit that you can't get from a phone call and that you can't get um, any other way. And then again, document, 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 share that. Um, be able to explain why you didn't pick systems, why you did pick a system, um, references and total cost of ownership, and that goes all to the uh, project sponsor team. They've got someone who they have to support. And the graphic over on the right, again, just another example of a spider chart radar. And again, the 
further out you get, the better it is. And, and just briefly, the organization that, or the solution that was in the green here, um, people in operations and executives like that the best. Um, the system that was in the gold, HR like the best, so this was an HCM system selection. And then the orange system um, that's closest into the bullseye, nobody liked that. Or they should say, they liked it the least. Um, just a, a, a blurb on, on some cloud um, key advantages here. And on-premise systems are changing as well, but uh, I'll say the cloud has all the stuff built into it um, to where it's easy to deploy. There's no, there's less cost up front um, to deploy it. Implementations are similar. Um, they stay current. You get a couple releases a year. And that's one of the things that I did want to make sure that you understand is that if you do change a system, even if you're upgrading to something to the latest and greatest, it's optimization, keeping, keeping current at least, if not ahead. But releases are, are done several times a year. Some, some systems do it more often, but almost everybody is doing some major upgrades, um, major changes twice a year, new functions, features. You need to exploit those, you need to use those. And if I make an analogy to a, a car, a car has to have its oil changed, it needs its tires rotated, it needs its windows washed once in a while so you can see out of it. And everybody understands that. Um, not everybody does it, but everybody understands, everybody understands that if you do that routine maintenance to keep current and, and keep the system well running, it's gonna last a lot longer and have a lot more value to you um, in meeting your needs than if you don't. Um, and simplify processes, yet maintain those controls. And again, document this with your users, let them know what's happening, involve them, communicate. Um, so, so really, what do you do next? Um, I think some of the better things to do or start a benchmark, and I showed that one benchmark at, up at the front, just high level of some things you can do to look at your maturity. Um, those are some sample areas that were important to a client. Um, looking at options that you have. Do you have options to uh, perhaps change the system? Maybe you can't do it, um, it's not in the budget for 2017, but you can prepare through benchmarking and road mapping to get something set up for 2018. Sharing your vision, and that's to those key stakeholders. And then I, I have here, be a change agent. And this is again, what's, the, what's in it for me? And I look at things from the perspective of how does it help the organization? If the organization's healthy, then more than likely I'm gonna have a healthy position. And I do that by adding value to the organization rather than and just sitting. Um, and I talked about communicating in that roadmap. Is, is once a quarter enough to communicate what's happening? I don't think so. By once a quarter, I forgot even what we're talking about. Once a week, if you communicate once a week, I, I bet you will get your email tagged as spam and it will go to either a low priority folder or um, because people just can't see communication on what you're doing every week, unless it's perhaps with the lie or you're bringing something up. But somewhere between, you know, a few weeks, um, sometime, you know, maybe five, six weeks, I think is a good time just to tell people about what's happened, that you've had these achievements, and that you've, what's coming up next, and maybe what your roadblocks are. Um, so at this point, Dana, let's, I'd like to open up to questions and you know some common questions that I see from clients are, you know, why change and update the HCM system? You know, what's the value? The benchmarking roadmap? Uh, you know, what's the process and value? And hopefully, I've given you a little bit of information on that. Next steps and uh, my contact information is below. If you need it, you can always contact us through the, our website, and it will get routed to the the right person. It happens all the time. And it's pretty darn timely. Um, my little graphic is just that your sure thing that you're on right now, if it's old at all, it is shrinking. 
and you are going to have to make a leap at some point in time. And if you're going to make that leap, let's think about exactly why you're doing it. And that's getting some hard data. How to get there is your roadmap. And if you need a new system, um, we, we talked about that as well, some steps. So at this point, Jana, I'll open up to questions. Great. Well, um, Richard, before we begin the q and A, I I just want to thank you for taking the time to present to all of us today. This has been fantastic, and I'm sure our attendees have learned some extremely valuable information. We do have a couple of questions from some of our attendees, and before we get into the Q&A, just a reminder um, to our attendees that if you do have questions, just type them into the questions window, and we will get to them as soon as we can. And if we run out of time today and don't get to all the questions, uh, what we will do is just contact each of you individually so everyone's questions will get answered in some way or form. Our first question for you, Richard, is how much time does it take to do a benchmark and a roadmap? Um, that varies all over the place, but I'm, I'm glad that whoever asked that because it's not an afternoon thing. Um, the benchmark requires, if you're doing it yourself, it calls, requires some research into, let's say, Forrester and Gardner. We have a lot of data ourselves on how much time, it, you know, how many FTEs, what people, systems are people are using. So you can get benchmark data there and then compare yourself against it. You can also um, use a lot of providers, ourselves included, but there's a lot of people that provide benchmarking information. And again, you want, to want facts. You don't want opinion, you want hard facts on how you compare to competitors in the industry and maybe people at large. And to directly answer your question, Dana, because I got off of that, if you're doing it yourself, I would say anywhere from 20 to 40 hours. And if you hired that out, I would say it still takes at least a couple of days worth of effort because someone's going to need information from you and to do all that work and they'll do it more thoroughly because they have access to more data and then present it back to you. And of course, it takes time to give them data and then review and consume what they have found about your organization. Great, thanks Richard. Our uh, next question is, did the talent-driven organizations self-identify or did they meet some criteria? They met criteria, they didn't self-identify. And so what we, we do with them is we identify those that are, and I didn't include that information just because it takes up a little, a little bit too much time, but it's in the survey, um, the findings that you can download. And it talks specifically criteria that they have to meet. And then we, I, I select those, those um, organizations and then we compare them to the overall results and that's where we see like 100% of them do succession management and that they, for publicly traded organizations, we can look at their um, income statements and their return on equity and then we can compare that to the organization at, at large. Um, and just to follow up on that, Richard, um, could you enlighten us about maybe what some of this criteria criteria um, is? Yeah, and and it's all about um, how many. Um, and you're putting me on the spot, Dan, which is great. <laughs> um, it's looking at, for example, who is doing succession management. So, so it's all about talent. What type of recruiting systems? What performance? What compensation? How are they treating their people? Um, developing them um, with training um, and using metrics to manage them. And again, the detailed information is, is in the survey. Great. Thanks, Richard. Uh, our next question is, do you see many organizations using a roadmap? Surprisingly, I see probably less than 50%. Um, a lot of organizations think that, or a lot of people, and it goes down to people, it's not the organization, a lot of people um, that aren't at the, the very highest level, um, and I'd say that's maybe the corporate plan, um, if it's just the systems, they believe they can keep it in their head and they can um, know what's, what are some of the general ideas, 
and they may carve out that we're going to let's change, say we're going to have a new um, ERP system. We're going to have a new um, customer service system. But they don't go into that detail exactly how to get there, um, what the dependencies are in different systems, when are they going to retire something. If it may take too long to get from, uh, say, from here to there with something new or something updated, and therefore they may need to recontract with whatever they have right now or patch what they have because they can't change it quick enough. Um, and that's part of the risk and the mitigation assessment as well. Um, but those organizations that have roadmaps do better because they're, they're planning for that change and they're getting budget, they're getting allocations of manpower. Uh, and so I say that the ones that succeed more with what they're trying to accomplish do have roadmaps. Well, Richard, I, we have to thank you again for taking the time to uh, join us today. And to all of our attendees, thank you for taking the time to join Sierra Cedar. Please be on the lookout for an email with links to download and access today's webinar and slide deck online. Um, all of these things will be included in the email, and that will be coming out in the next one to two hours following today's webinar. There will also be a link in the email that will direct you to a really short three to five minute survey we would incredibly appreciate your feedback, um, any feedback that you would have on today's webinar. And thank you all again, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much.